We're here with uh, Chris Hare today, who is actually one of the people that has um, stepped forward to challenge Senator Hatch this year. It should be a very interesting race. How are you doing? Pretty good. Thanks for coming today. Tell us about yourself. What's your background? I grew up most of my life here in Provo. Uh, I have a father that served in Vietnam. Taught me the importance of patriotism. Here in Provo, we have the Freedom Festival. Mm -hmm. And so growing up, I saw a lot of people that had paid a high price for freedom. I met a young man that had windsurfed from Cuba to uh, Florida, mm -hmm. uh, a fighter pilot that had flown from Siberia to Japan with his countrymen trying to shoot him down, a family that had built a hot air balloon from East Germany, homemade hot air balloon, and flew over to West Germany, all for the price of freedom. And then at the age of 18, uh, or, or excuse me, at the age of 16, I applied to a BYU semester abroad, got a presidential scholarship, and this was in 1982 and spent six months studying in Europe. And during that experience, I had uh, two experiences that kind of changed my life. One was seeing the Iron Curtain for the very first time. Uh, it was brutal in its appearance. It was iron. It was machine, uh, machine guns, tank traps, barbed wire, all to keep people in, because they had an economic system to keep people in. Uh, the other was an experience of actually traveling to West Berlin. And if you remember, West Berlin was actually completely surrounded by East Germany. Mm -hmm. And to get there, you actually had to take a train into West Berlin. And right before the train got into West Berlin, they stopped the train uh, to make sure that nobody had got jumped on the, the train and ran dogs underneath the train. And my friend took a picture of it, and we quickly learned that you don't take pictures of them running the dogs underneath the trains. Uh, the border guards jumped on the train and uh, ripped out the film and detained us for some while. But supposedly there was a secret military installation that they didn't want pictures taken of. Mm -hmm. But really it was just the inhumaneness of running dogs underneath the train to get people that wanted freedom. What are the principles that have drawn you into the Republican Party? It's the principles of, of limited government, uh, of inalienable rights. There are certain principles that come from our Heavenly Father that government doesn't even grant. Uh, and it's, it's having lived under systems of, and seen socialism in action that um, I know that it doesn't work. Uh, after I, in 1992, right when I finished my master's in organizational behavior, I took a teaching job in the former Soviet Union. And I'll never forget, I, I stepped off the plane and there was a young woman holding up a sign with my name on it. Uh, I figured I got through seven years at BYU without getting married. The Lord was going to have to do something a little bit more to help me get married. And there she is back there, my beautiful wife uh, mm -hmm. I met uh, while I was teaching there. But while living in the Soviet Union, I constantly saw abuses of that system of socialism. It doesn't work. It robs the pe people of their full potential. It weakens the family. And it eventually morally, and as we're seeing in Europe right now, financially bankrupts the system. It, it simply does not work. And it causes all sorts of other problems. Uh, my wife is constantly amazed at the amount of volunteerism that we have in this great country. You'd think uh, in a system that kind of forced collectivism that it would force people to, to volunteer, but it produces just the opposite. It produces envy of those people that have, uh, have things, and it produces mm -hmm. resentment of, of having to, uh, to, to do service. And so you know, I constantly saw abuses. And the thing is that even at, even that system, it doesn't create an equal system. There was two hospitals for the political people and for the regular people. They they had a term that was called useful per people, and you were a useful person if you controlled something. Like if you were a meat shop owner, mm -hmm. you kept the best meats in the back and you traded them. So there was almost a free market system underneath the undercurrent of, of, of communism. That doesn't surprise me at all because I look at uh, free market economics and, and you can tell me how you feel about it. I feel that it is a law, not a theory. It is what it is. I kind of look at it as, as a, a river, you might say, and they can do what they want to dam it up, but eventually the water is going to get through. No, that's exactly right. I think there are certain principles that you, you, trade, you trade and people use what they can to, to survive. The irony is is that when you think about the Soviet Union, you think of the greatness of their athletics. Mm -hmm. But the most capitalistic part of their system was actually the athletic system. My sister-in-law was the last Soviet Union fencing champion in the Soviet Union. But there was great incentive for a coach. If a coach were out to 
t and went out and found uh, an athlete and took them and wrote, made them rise to the national level, mm -hmm. their salary quadrupled. Wow. So there was great incentive for them to go out and train youth, find a talented youth and then kind of groom them for them to get on the national level because their salary quadrupled. And you'd think, well, here, it's a socialist system. Everybody was supposed to get paid the same. But but that's not how it, it was. Happened. And it was the same way for the athlete. If the athlete r rose to that level, they were pretty much taken care of for the rest of their life. They, uh, they could fence for a year or, so, or do their athletic for years, and then they, they could became a coach and had a kind of a cook, cushy position. And so it's your, 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 your theory is exactly right. Huh. So philosophically, which of the founding fathers would you most identify with? Well, I, I like to actually consider myself uh, because I kind of have a passionate spirit like uh, Patrick Henry. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick Henry uh, had a great love and a great passion for individual freedom. Mm -hmm. And most people don't realize that, but it was actually a speech given in the uh, 1760s by Patrick Henry that motivated uh, George, or, uh, Thomas Jefferson. He listened to that speech and that, that speech changed his life. Now most of us are familiar with Patrick Henry's speech, you know, give me liberty or give me death speech, mm -hmm. but he was very influential throughout the entire process. And it's interesting, as you may know, we formed the Patrick Henry Caucus here in the state of Utah three years ago that was concentrating on the Tenth Amendment uh, on state sovereignty. And a lot, some people have criticized, well, don't you know that Patrick Henry didn't support the Constitution? Well, most people don't realize the reason he didn't support the Constitution is because it didn't contain the Bill of Rights. Just think where we would be today if we didn't have the Bill of Rights. You know, for many of the Founding Fathers, the Bill of Rights was, they were, it was just so obvious that they didn't even need to be that. But, but Patrick Henry insisted that the Bill of Rights be put in there. Now, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, you look at the Ninth Amendment, the Tenth Amendment, all those amendments are absolutely crucial for our time. And it's because of Patrick Henry, he stood up and he eventually supported the Constitution after those were included in, in, uh, as amendments. But I'm grateful that we have the Bill of Rights because just think of, of how the federal government would be overstepping us if we didn't at least have the Tenth Amendment and the Ninth Amendment to try to push back on the federal government. But you think where you'd be without the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. That's one of the things that I really believe keeps the federal government at bay. It's one of those things people even go back to World War II and one of the reasons that Jack Japan didn't really seriously consider invading the United States is they knew that as soon as they came inland they would have an army of, of hunters uh, fighting against them. So for, for me, that's, he's probably the, the one that I feel the most uh, akin to. What are the successes of the Patrick Henry Caucus? I think if you want to see the successes of the Patrick Henry Caucus, all you have to do is look at uh, Senator Hatch's mailers that he sent out over the last couple of weeks. His last one, he talked about the lands issues. Uh, two years ago, I ran legislation that got national attention, pushing back on the federal government for reclaiming our state sovereignty with, with uh, regards to lands. That's one of the things that everybody's talking about right now is lands, and I'm grateful that they were talking about it. Uh, so the lands issue, I think, is a great success of the Patrick Henry Caucus. You look at a, another thing that, that Senator Hatch has sent out, talking about Ob Obamacare. It was actually the state legislature that has given 26 states standing to fight Obamacare in state legislature. It was a sophomore legislator, member of the Patrick Henry Caucus, uh, Representative Carl Rimmer, that uh, passed the opt-out of Obamacare. And we had to push that uh, bill. There was actually legislators that thought it was foolish. We pushed it anyway with the help of the grassroots movement. And it was because of that bill, we had a law that went into effect one day before Obamacare went into effect saying you couldn't have an individual ma mandate. And that case, that the state of Utah was cited by the judge in Florida as giving 26 states standing. So that's another thing. We were talking about uh, fiscal responsibility before it was popular to do so. We were encouraging people to resist stimulus money because of all the strings that came attached to it, federal money. And so, again, that's one of the things that Senator Hatch is now talking about is the, you know, the bad part of the bailouts of stimulus money and pushing back on the federal government. So I think the Patrick Henry Caucus and, and 
as being a co-founder of it, that's been one of my primary functions is to push back. And we've set the debate for this election cycle. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've done for the last six years. You had mentioned that you, you met your wife overseas. That gives you, I think, special insight perhaps on, on the issue of immigration. What do you think were the successes of the immigration debate um, from last cycle versus the failings, and what would you like to have had done differently? The thing that I felt like I brought to the conversation is helping people understand the harm that's caused by illegal immigration. One of my frustrations is you'll constantly hear people talk about that illegal immigration is the victimless crime. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely not the case. The state of Utah spends well over $400 million uh, educating, medicating, incarcerating illegal aliens. And then we often forget about the victims here in our own communities, those that are preyed upon uh, because of illegal immigration, uh, legal immigrants that are having to compete against illegal labor. We, we're, we don't have compassion for those individuals. Uh, I have constituents that have gone out of business because they, by the time they pay their workers' comp and unemployment insurance, they simply can't compete. But my biggest frustration with it is that it, it harms those individuals that are doing everything right. I've been outside the embassies in both Kiev and Moscow and seen parents in tears when they were denied visas to come to this country. And so where's the compassion for those individuals? Most people don't realize that the standard of living in Ukraine, where my wife is from, is half that of Mexico, where the majority of illegal aliens come from. My business partner is from Ethiopia. The standard of living is one fifteenth that of uh, Mexico. He's lost four of his siblings to violence. Mm -hmm. And so where's the compassion for, for him? And we seem to be discriminating against those that are doing things right. And Regardless of where the state has, has gone with it, I think we've gone backwards in some things that we continue to s discriminate. We have to bear responsibility. There's, there's a, uh, a horrific video in many cases it's called Which Way Home? It's a documentary that talks about these children that go from southern Mexico to, uh, to the border on trains and the yeah. horrific things from, from rape to uh, death to hunger because we tolerate illegal immigration. We have to bear responsibility for that. Uh, since we allow illegal immigration, people are coming here. Uh, I was the sponsor of the first human trafficking bill here in the state of Utah. And most people don't realize that the number one way that people get caught up in the horrors of human trafficking is the promise of a better job. And so by allowing it, we bear some of the responsibility for it. Actually, a great portion of the responsibility. So we think we're doing something compassionate but really we're causing misery throughout the world. And we're discriminating. Frankly, our policy is racist against the black African, against the Asian, uh, the Russian Jew. We're discriminating against those people that are trying to do things legally. And one of my frustrations is that America is, we are a, a nation of immigrants, and no nation has brought so many different ethnic groups, races, religions, even political differences together in relative peace as the United States. But the thing that's important is also the melting pot, and we've lost that, that portion of it, the stressing of the, more, uh, the melting pot, that people come to America and then want to be part of the culture. One of my frustrations is what multiculturalism has been used over the years is it's fine to value other cultures, but it's another to use multiculturalism to undermine our own culture. Uh, our founding fathers had a a great system of government. I'm absolutely embarrassed at Judge Chief Justice or Justice uh, Ruth Gator Ginsburg, who was embarrassed at the U.S. Constitution, which is to me the heart and soul of our cu cu culture, mm -hmm. where she suggested to Egypt that they don't look towards our Constitution, that they look to the South American or South African Constitution that has positive rights. One, one of the most interesting experiences that I've had recently is being back in Washington, D.C., you go to the Jefferson Memorial, you go to the Lincoln Memorial, and you feel inspired. Because all the quotes there have to do about God, and about our rights come from God. But you go to FDR's uh, uh, National Monument, and or National Memorial, and all of those rights come from government. You know, it's the freedom from want, the freedom uh, from the right to have work. 
government granting those rights, and there's a completely different spirit. And so I would encourage everybody, next time that they're in Washington, D.C., to spend some time at the Lincoln and the Jefferson Memorial, and then go contrast that feeling with what's at the FDR Memorial. Interesting. HB 116 uh, specifically was extremely controversial. Where did you fall on that particular bill, and what would you like to have seen done differently with it? Uh, I spoke against the bill for a number of reasons. First off, it was blatantly con unconstitutional. Even uh, the author of the, of the bill recognized that it was unconstitutional. It was supposed to be a message bill but uh, to get the federal government's uh, attention. But I don't think that you do a message bill that is clearly unconstitutional. And again, the problem, we had a bill this last session that, that dealt with that. The problems of it is that we have all these illegal aliens that have come thinking that they can actually get uh, legal. And we passed a bill this last session regulating those that deal with helping people be, uh, become legal because what was happening is all these illegal aliens are getting ripped off. They're coming to Utah, they're paying $5,000 to consultants or attorneys to help them get legal with the law and they're getting ripped off because there's no way to get legal with the law under 116. Mm -hmm. And so we've created a whole cottage industry, is what they've said. And so for me, it's, it, it's clearly, that's one of the reasons I'm running for federal government, is that we need to make sure that the federal government deals with the issue. We need to open the front door as wide as possible, recognizing that at different times we need to close it when we have higher unemployment. But we need to absolutely close the back door uh, because it's simply not fair to those people around the world that are trying to come here. But 116, it put... Uh, employers in uh, a difficult situation that they were having to pay money to the state instead of to Social Security. We asked the governor's council if, if he would follow that law. And, uh, he had to admit no, that he wouldn't recommend anybody following the law. It, it had whole, a whole sorts of problems, but again, for me, uh, what we did this session is we had to regulate those that are advising illegal aliens and, and legal immigrants uh, because we're giving false hope. And for me, there's nothing worse than giving false hope to somebody. It's better to tell them, tell them as it is. Mm -hmm. but, but again, we're responsible for these people losing money. They're risking everything to come here. Then they're paying, forking over money. And as a state, we're responsible for that. We'll be held accountable, I believe, for that someday. What is it specifically about this race that prompted you to jump into it? Uh, the reason I'm jumping in is because I feel that there's a very short window of opportunity to change things. It's a little bit frightening to me about how people don't understand the world around us right now. The difference between us and Greece in all practicality is, is that we, can, we have the ability to print money. Greece does not uh, because we're the world reserve currency. And most people don't realize that there are nations around the world that are trying to set up a reserve currency. China is trying to set up a world reserve currency with uh, some of its Asian neighbors. Uh, other nations, for example, uh, India is now buying its oil from Iran with gold. And so once the dollar is no longer the reserve currency, we're going to have a whole host of problems. People think that we've, we've had relative peace for the last oh, 60, 70 years, and uh, it's going to come collapsing down if we don't change things. And the frightening thing for me is that or the frustrating thing for me is that we have the capability of doing this. We have enough natural resources. If we simply get the federal government out of our way, we can uh, pull ourselves out of this economic uh, crisis. We have enough oil in Colorado, Wyoming, and Utah. We have more than the entire Middle East. There's no reason that we shouldn't be like North Dakota that has 2% unemployment. But the biggest impediment is the federal government getting in our way. We have over a trillion dollars in the cleanest burning coal in the Grand, Grand National Grand Staircase. Uh, and that's one of the things that I've been pushing for the last four years of, in, in the state legislature. I'm grateful, again, that Senator Hatch now seems to be talking about it. But he's had 36 years to deal with that. He pushed it back uh, in the 1970s during the Sagebrush Rebellion, but he should have pushed through. Again, the reason that I'm running is the sense of urgency that I have. My wife and I, as we were trying to debate whether to come in, to, to jump into this race, I'd look at our five children and we would think that they were the biggest reason for us not to run, frankly. But we would look at our five children and they were the reason for us to run. 
my wife has lived through uh, socialized uh, medicine. She literally bears the scars of socialized medicine through uh, an intrusive federal government. Uh, she knows the direction that we're ha headed. And she was absolutely appalled four years ago when we had neighbors that had President Obama signs uh, on their neighbors. We, I ran away from this. I escaped this. This does not end well. And there seems to be a lack of education among the general population that socialism doesn't work. One of, you know, one of the many opportunities I've had as a representative is I have an opportunity to go speak. And I was up at the University of Utah speaking about three years, and I, I mentioned one of the, the three great threats that I thought was facing this nation. And I remember I mentioned socialism, the acceptance of socialism. And the audience erupted in this great, uh, almost mocking laughter, about a third of the audience. And I was unprepared. I was expecting people to just roll their eyes, to smile, but, but it was mocking laughter. And for me, it was sad that these individuals don't get that the system that, that we're putting in place doesn't work. And so that's one of the things that I bring to this race, is for me, it's a core value. I have lived. I have seen socialized medicine hospitals. I've spent five, five years of my life in socialized countries. I have a wife that constantly reminds me about the blessings that we have in this country, great country. And I'm willing to fight, uh, stand up and fight against uh, those that would have us adopt a different system. Uh, for me, it's not something that I understand it academically. I understand it to my core. And so that's why I'm running. That's what I bring to this race. I've also demonstrated that I'm not afraid to take on the diff diff difficult issues. Uh, illegal immigration seems to be the fourth rail of politics, just like Social Security. And I've been willing to address it and say, hey, this is simply not right. Uh, if we do nothing, we'll become a sanctuary state. Sure enough, we've become a sanctuary state. Uh, it's breaking, the cost is breaking our hospitals. You look at the 80 hospitals in uh, Southern California that have gone out of business because of it. It wasn't popular, I've been called all sorts of names, but I've been willing to stand up. I'm willing to say socialism is, is wrong. I'm willing to say, hey, if we don't quickly reform our entitlement programs and cut out entitled, uh, entire programs uh, and grow our economy, that we're going to experience hyperinflation. And I've experienced hyperinflation, and I don't want to see my neighbors go through that. Uh, the people that are hurt the most in hyperinflation are those that did everything right, those that saved their money, those that were frugal, and overnight, people can see their life savings wiped out just like that. And if we don't do things quickly, uh, if Washington doesn't change, if we keep even the same old Republicans, this nation's in trouble. Although I'm really surprised that the issue hasn't died down yet, there's still a lot of hullabaloo over the contraception issue. i, I got to ask, do you or any other Republicans have any plan to take away contraception? Because I haven't heard anything about that. I am surprised that there is that, that that's continued to stay up in the media, that, that issue. The issue is, and this is what the media likes to do a lot, is confuse the issues. The issue is really not about contraception. It's about uh, a First Amendment right of the organization. The Catholic Church has a policy against uh, the use of contraception. And so the issue is really, do, does the government have the right to force them to provide something that's against their religion? I mean, personally, uh, I don't have to hold the same beliefs on contraception as the Catholic Church does. But I will stand by the Catholic Church when their rights are attacked by the federal government. And it's an intrusion of the federal government. And so that's the issue is, are we going to sit around and let other, the federal government take away individuals' rights? Because if they do it to the Catholic Church, they will soon do it to the LDS Church. They'll soon do it to uh, the Protestant Church. They'll soon probably do it to all religions. And then eventually they'll start to take away uh, my right to express my opinion about other issues that will have politically correct speech, and then that will be taken away. And so the issue is nothing to do with contraception. It's all about the Catholic's right ability to provide or the, the type of services that it, that it wants to provide. And if it, has, if it feels strongly about that issue, it shouldn't have to provide contraceptive use. That's, it's just simply that. But that's the issue. So for me, it's a freedom of religion issue. And like I said, I don't have the same concern that they do. But I will stand by the Catholic Church in defending their right to believe what they want and to administer the way that they want. It's already frustrating that the, we have lost, we've put Catholic charities out of business. They're no longer 
in many respects in the adoption agency because they were having to uh, provide for adoption to, to families that they didn't think were were appropriate. And so now there's a whole set of kids that don't have that ability of Catholic services. And so that's what happens when the federal government gets involved in things that should it shouldn't be involved in. It really hurts individual liberty and it help it hurts charity in the end. Because what will happen is probably in the end the Catholic Church will just stop providing all health care insurance yeah. if they're forced to do this. And who's benefited by that? Yeah. So along those lines there's all of the nonsense going on about getting Rush Limbaugh off the air. I don't personally agree with how he phrased that particular argument. I do wonder, should the government have a role in regulating speech on the radio? The, the government's role is not to, especially political speech, that's what they were not supposed to, uh, now will I justify all of Rush Limbaugh's comments? No. But you look at, there seems to be a double standard. You know, Bill Maher can say absolutely horrible things about Sarah Palin and get away with it. Much, much worse than what a Russian Lim Limbaugh uh, has ever said. And yet, they don't go after his sponsors or his... Uh, and so really what it's uh, trying to do is just to cut down political free speech. And so that's the thing that, again, concerns me about the issue is, again, you don't have to listen to Rush Limbaugh. And do I agree 100% of things with, with everything that Rush says or says. Uh, no, there's some things, or, or the way that he phrases it, can it be better and can we be more civil as a society? Yeah, but but let's have let's have an honest debate about it. And he is much more calm and normal than what's on Bill Maher or I was listening to, you know, MSNBC the other day and the horrific things that they say. They have the ability to say what they want. I don't think they should be shut down. I just think that political speech should be should, should be free. With all the saber rattling that has been coming out of, especially Iran, what recommendations would you make to uh, as a senator to resolve the instability in the Middle East? I do believe that one of the primary functions of the federal government is actually military. That it's important that we have a strong military. I, I, I believe as Ronald Reagan did, the peace through strength. Mm -hmm. the, this might seem a, a little bit different answer to your question, but the problem that we have right now is that, is that we're dependent on so much of what goes through the Middle East, uh, the, the oil that goes through there, and there's no reason for us to, to be that dependent on the Middle East when we have the natural resources here in, in, in the United States. My primary focus when I went back to Washington, D.C. is make sure that we had access to our lands, that we got back to the basics of being energy self-sufficient so that it wasn't as crucial. You know, the concern is if Iran shuts down the Straits River Mints that we will have $6, $7, $8 gallon gasoline, which will send our struggling economy in a tailspin. But that's because we get over 55% of our oil from uh, foreign countries. We need to make sure that we develop here uh, and wean ourselves off of that foreign oil so that it's not as a big concern so that we don't, in many respects, we can choose whether to deal with it or not. We need to make sure that we get the Keystone Pipeline it makes no sense that we have a, a neighbor to our north that wants to give it to us, but that we're holding that up for political reasons. And China is in the process of building a pipeline to the west coast. And so if we don't hurry up and, and build that pipeline right now, all of that's going to go to China. And I'm, I'm a big believer that one of the things that we need to do to stay and for our national security is become self-sufficient. People don't realize that China is around the world buying up oil contracts 30 years out. We get the majority of our oil from Mexico. Within 10 years, Mexico is supposed to consume all of that oil internally as its economy grows. And so what are we going to do? Where are we going to go out and buy oil on the open market? Uh, and so that's why we've got to kind of almost have a Manhattan-style energy development project here. And it's not something that the government really has to do. It just needs to get out of the way. Again, Utah should be like North Dakota with 2% unemployment, uh, where jobs are looking for people and people aren't looking for jobs. So we need to make sure that we concentrate on becoming self-sufficient. Uh, one of the side notes of this that frightens me too is in 2010 we became a net importer of food because we're burning our fuel with our ridiculous ethanol policies. And so as far as foreign policy goes, 
I think what you do is you, you build a stable, uh, self-contained society, and then you, you have more luxuries, whether to deal with uh, on how you deal with Iran. Uh, on the subject of the economy, because that is probably the biggest issue on the table right now, uh, we're wondering if you are somebody that would consider yourself more of a Keynesian, or would you consider yourself more akin to a Ludwig von Mises or an F.A. Hayek? I would definitely consider myself more of a Malam Hayek. Uh, one of my favorite books is The Road to Serfdom. I think it should, in many respects, I think it's a shame that uh, all our school children don't read it. You look at the, the process of that. You know, government does not create jobs. It is the private sector. Uh, for me, the, the role of a government is to, 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 to make you know, a relatively level playing field. I mean, it doesn't prove, you know, you've got to have a stable society, but when government starts to pick and choose winners, when it starts to dump money here or dump money there, what it's doing is it's, uh, it's robbing the system of efficiencies. And I constantly saw this when I was teaching them in the former Soviet Union. I would always tell my students that as long as they had mafias, government corruption, and bribery, uh, they would never get the full, mark, the full benefit of free market because it wasn't necessarily the best business that rose to the top. It was the business that knew how to work the system, how to get the government contract or to how to bribe the right official. And so you might have a company that had a great idea, but it couldn't compete with somebody that had a competitive advantage from the government. And that's what's happening with many of all said that we have, where the government picks and chooses win winners. I mean, it used to be government, uh, big business that, that wanted the government out of things, but now you got your GEs that are trying to get favorable treatment. And that's why we have such a problem in Washington, D.C., is everybody is trying to get uh, a political favor. And one of your best investments is for a lobbyist to get this tax break or to get this grant or to get that. It hasn't worked out very well with Solyndra or other things. When government picks and chooses winners, it's going to it's always going to pick wrong, and it messes up the entire economy. The best thing that they can do is simply get out, let the free market take care of itself. There's a video on, on YouTube that you're taking a lot of heat for. Apparently you had indicated that you would be willing to raise the debt ceiling, which is an incredibly unpopular position to be taking. Can you qualify that a bit? Uh, that came from a debate where I was asked a yes or no question, and I knew it wasn't the popular decision. But I support cut, cap, and balance. Mike Lee's cut, cap, and balance, which basically allows one raise of the debt ceiling if there isn't a, a strong economic plan in place. And so it's been misconstrued that I would, I would support a debt ceiling raise just to support a debt ceiling raise. That's absolutely not the fact. There has to be a, a, a firm plan in place that's been passed, not something in the, in the future. I would not have voted for the debt ceiling uh, to be raised uh, last August like everybody else did for a couple of reasons. First, there was no plan in place like cut, cap and balance requires. The second thing, though, that it did is that it gave uh, the Obama administration the ability to raise it in the future. They, they gave away their legislative power. And so I believe that our national debt has become one of our na greatest national security debt issues. And so I will not, they, they know with Herod uh, back there that they will not get my vote to raise the debt uh, ceiling unless there is a firm plan to reduce the national debt and take it down uh, over a reasonable amount of period. Because uh, what happens a lot of times is they play chicken, uh, they, they, they don't do anything and then they get and they'll say, well, if you don't vote for the debt ceiling, uh, it'll be your fault that the economy collapses. And what I'm saying is I'm lending that note beforehand. I'm telling everybody I will not raise vote for the debt ceiling. Don't, don't come and try to say it's my fault if there's not a plan in place. And so I, I, would, I would vote for it once, like cap, cut Mike Lee's cut cap and balance if there was a plan in place. Uh, I would prefer that we didn't even get to that place that we started cutting right now. My concern is is that they're not going to make the cuts until we're pushed up against that. Uh, but, but my goal would be to go back there and dramatically increase our revenues through development of our natural resources, dramatically cutting uh, the programs that we have right now so that it's not even an issue. But unfortunately the way that Washington usually works is it's kind of brinkmanship and they wait until the very last moment until about we're about ready to default. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, but that's, that's why I, it's one of those things that would have been just simply easier to say no. And I knew that that's what the crowd wanted to hear. But the type of individual I am is that I knew under 
if I supported cut, cap, and balance, that, that, that I would support it once. And so I answered yes. I've also learned never to answer yes or no questions without being able to qualify. What the, what the video doesn't show is my explanation of the answer at the very end of the debate. That just shows me at that one. And again, that's what you get with me. I'll because uh, I believe everybody on that panel supports cut, cap, and balance. Uh, but I, in many respects, I think I was the only one to answer that truthfully, despite you know, when you get a yes or no answer uh, or question, you don't have a chance to qualify. So I am, like I said, against raising the debt ceiling. Uh, and the only situation I would ever even consider in it is under cut, cap, and balance with a meaningful plan that had a tough things to make sure that, you know, for me it's not just reducing the deficit. I want to get rid of the deficit and actually pay down the national debt. With the debt getting as bad as it has been, and with all kinds of talk of, of becoming like Greece and total economic collapse, are you the type of guy that would be satisfied with balancing the budget, or do you want to see the, the deficit and the debt completely paid off? I, I believe absolutely the debt needs to, to be paid off. The, the danger that I fear is that, um, that interest rates, as they start to rise, we're already consuming with the national debt the way it is, is about a quarter of our uh, national budget is just to pay the interest rate. That's with record low interest rates. My goal would be to pay the national debt off as quickly as possible. For me, it is really, in many respects, taxation without representation. Our children are paying for that. They didn't get a vote on that yet, and so it's our responsibility to make sure that we pay for it and uh, pay it down. Well, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate well, it. Thanks for coming over. I appreciate the All opportunity. Right.